In this video, we're going to be doing a slight introduction to the normal distribution. What does it look like? Why do we use it? And how can we use it? So we talked about in stats, we're very interested in getting things that are good enough to be able to make predictions, to model more or less what's going on. We don't have perfect information. We don't have every object in our population. We don't have every result anyone ever got from this particular chemistry experiment. We can't predict anything with 100% certainty. But we can get models that are good enough that we can at least make useful predictions, that we can decide as a general rule, does something seem more likely than not likely to work? So what we like to do is we like to say, these are a bunch of situations. Now, here's a bunch of them that they're different, but the difference is more or less a cosmetic one. So when we were looking at our uniforms, we had we have a uniform distribution from two to four, and this has height one half. And we could have had a uniform distribution from 10 to 23. And this has height one over 13. They're both different distributions, but we solved questions about them the exact same way. We want to know the area in a particular region. We find the area underneath the curve. We find the height the exact same way for both of them. It's going to be 1 divided by the base. As long as I can go 1 divided by the base for any region, it's just base times height. If we can categorize them as being more or less the same up to a constant of some sort, then we can realize that we don't need to reinvent the wheel every time. I can just make one slight adjustment to the formula for that up to a constant kind of difference. One very common kind of distribution that we're going to see is the normal distribution. So the normal distribution is a bell-shaped curve. So we've all heard about things falling on the bell-shaped curve. The idea is that most things fall near the center. Things are symmetric on either side. We're just as likely to be above as we are to be a low, below, but also things get very unlikely fairly quickly. It doesn't take long for things to fall off. Uh, most people might arrive at a meeting around the exact same time. If we did a very good job at designing the test, most people would be around the average the best students would differentiate themselves and the students that weren't studying would differentiate themselves, but most people should be around the average. This is kind of the bell curve is the ideal of what we're looking for. There are lots of different things that we often describe using a bell curve. For example, the height of a single gen sex. So height of single sex, we could also have GPAs are often modeled by bell curves. Batting averages are modeled by bell curves a lot. There are a lot of different things that fall under this pattern. Now, again, we know nothing's going to be perfect. The idea is that we take sample data, a lot of sample data, we make a histogram, and we do our best to fit a curve over top. And if it looks close enough to being normal, you know, histograms might have a a few pieces that are a little bit bigger, a few pieces that are a little bit smaller, but as long as it's more or less in the pattern, we say good enough the smooth curve we can put on top. Let's figure out what are the minimum numbers I need to know to use this to model my probabilities, because then I can find probabilities for all my normal distributions in the exact same way. So. We said that that was a curve. Now, when we had that uniform distribution, we had a straight line. It was not hard to find the equation in that line, y is equal to height, straight line. The normal distribution has a slightly more complicated formula to it. So what this formula that I have here says, this is the function that graphs the bell-shaped curve. So this will describe the height of our normal density curve at x. So I plug in an x, it tells me what the height of that curve is. Now if we look at this, we'll notice that 
Okay, x is our variable that we're plugging into our equation. So that's our unknown. But when we look at the rest of them, these numbers that we have, we have 2 is a constant, pi is a constant, 1 is a constant, 1 is a constant, 2 is a constant, squared term is a constant. What do I have left over? Well, I have the sigma squared left over, sigma, and mu. Those are parameters of populations. Those are constant, but different for each population that we're looking at. So what's the minimum that I need to know to be able to figure out what my density curve looks like? I need to know mu and I need to know the value of sigma. Everything else is already known and I'm plugging in. So if I want to find my probability, I need the formula for my density curve so I can find the area underneath. The only thing I need to get my density curve is mu and sigma. We want to think that mu sigma are the minimal information that I need to know to describe a normal distribution. Just like in uniform, the beginning and end point were the minimal information we needed to solve the uniform. So we say that mu and sigma are the parameters for our normal distribution. If I know mu sigma, I can completely describe it. So we have this thought that for every combination of mu sigma, we'll get a slightly different normal density curve, but it will have the same shape and it will have the same uh, relative proportions to it. So this idea of family of normal distributions, we called our set of all normal distributions. So we recognize that there are an infinite number of mu sigmas. They all lead to a slightly different curve, but they all have that same formula up to a constant and we're going to solve all of them in the exact same way. The properties that these all have in common, it's symmetric about mean because it was symmetric, symmetric about mu, symmetric distribution. We know that the median is also the same thing as the mean because there's an equal amount of stuff above and below. It's single peaked. Remember we had exactly one top to it. It extends infinitely far in either direction. So this falls under the all models are wrong, some are useful. Technically speaking, our range is negative infinity to positive infinity, which quite frankly is stupid for almost anything real life. We said we're describing GPAs. No one has a plus 20 billion GPA or a negative 5 trillion GPA. What kind of student has a negative 5 trillion GPA? But I... It might be fun to have a positive 20 billion GPA. Anyways, we know it's not practical. The idea is we also said that the height of this curve gets super small and probabilities fall off very quickly. So there reaches a point where for all practical purposes, the area underneath the curve is zero. So even though we know almost nothing is going to be exactly described by the normal curve, negative infinity to positive infinity, Anything values that have a relevant probability will be represented in our population. So again, close enough for practical purposes is what we're thinking about. And because there always has to be some sort of positive probability, even if it's teeny, teeny, tiny, totally insignificant, that curve will never touch the x-axis. All right, so we have two things that are describing it as a parameter. Mu, we know that the mean is our measure of center, so we call it a location parameter. As we move mu, it's going to shift the curve to the right or to the left, depending on whether we increase mu or whether we decrease mu. So what I have here is graphs of three normal distributions. They all have the same sigma, so we'll notice they have the same width, each of them. They have the identical shape. The only difference is where they're centered. So this one is centered at minus 5, this one is centered at 0, this one is centered at 5. The one centered at minus 5, it has mu minus 5. The one centered at 0, mu 0. One centered at 5, it has mu 5. The peak is the median, which is also the mean because it's symmetric. So that is what the mu tells us, where our data is located. So if equal sigmas mean same shape, that must mean that if instead I kept mu constant, but I changed my sigma, it is going to change the shape. So sigma shape parameter, it's about variation from the mean. 
The bigger the sigma, the wider the curve. The smaller the sigma, the narrower the curve. So if we look here, I have three different normal distributions. They all have the same mu, because look, they're all centered here at zero, but I've given them different levels of sigma. So this green one here has sigma one half. It is the smallest sigma, so it's the narrowest. Then the red one, this one is the next widest one. It has a bigger sigma, so it's wider. And then we have our blue one that has sigma of two. It's the next widest one because it's the next biggest. But notice something, not only did they get wider, but they got shorter. Why is that? Remember, they're density curves. To be a valid density curve, we must have that the area underneath the curve is equal to one. So if I am pushing the curve down, all of the stuff for the height of the green, it has to go somewhere. So if this peaks downwards, it has to get fatter. The same thing, you can think that if I have that blue one and it's wide like this, if I'm making it narrower, what happens to the area region, it has to go up. It shoots up because it has nowhere to go sideways. So that is the idea of what's going on here. Our sigma controls the shape, both how high it is and how wide it is. And if you're interested in my slides, I do have the R code for making these. Totally just for interest sake, but you're welcome to go and look it up. Now, one last thing we want to say before we start getting into calculating is, oh, hey, normal distribution is a very common curve that we often use. So we would like a shorthand way of describing it. We don't want to always have to go, this is a normal distribution and these are all the parameters and here's that formula and let me plug in those values so you can see what the formula looks like. We want a nice and shorthand. So the way we denote distributions, families of distributions in particular in stats is we put the name of our variable. So if my variable is called x, put x, this tilde, stands for follows, or you could think it's distributed as. Then we put the distribution name, so n for normal. We'll look at other distributions and they will have other shorthands that are commonly accepted. Then in the brackets, we put the parameters that are the minimal parameters we need to know in order to solve our question. So here, these are the minimal parameters needed to solve. So if I was describing a uniform distribution, so the side here, if y was uniform, I might say y is, some people use u, some people use unif, and then I would describe it as my endpoints. The beginning endpoint, the beginning endpoint, and the ending endpoint, beginning and endpoints. Uh, those are all I need to know to know my distribution. For my normal, I need to know my mu and sigma, and then I am going to be good to go. Now, whenever I write something, I can just write this, and anyone who's well enough into stats to be wanting to read my work about normal distributions is going to know what I'm talking about. All right, now that we know what the distribution looks like and how to categorize it, we're going to start to look at how do we find probabilities next.